Welcome to She Done It. I'm Caroline Crampton. An endlessly fascinating aspect of the golden age of detective fiction is its identification with a certain kind of Britishness. Many of the authors who are widely read from the genre's heyday in the 1920s and 1930s were either from the UK or were based here for some of the time that they were writing. As such, a certain amount of that context came to be strongly identified with these books. But at the same time, the likes of Agatha Christie, Dorothy L. Sayers, John Dixon Carr, Marjorie Allingham and others had readers all around the world. And the international fan base for mystery fiction is still growing today. How does the version of Britishness conveyed by these books land in other places? And what influence has it had on how crime writing has developed elsewhere? These are questions that I'm keen to explore in greater depth on the podcast, starting with today's episode. For today, we're going to look at the whodunit in India. This is a place with strong historic connections with Britain and British culture because of colonisation, and also somewhere with its own deep traditions of storytelling and mythology. I am very far from being an expert in this, though, So luckily, my guest today is someone who knows a lot more about being both a reader and a writer of crime fiction in India. He is R.V. Raman, author of both thrillers and whodunits set in his home country. In fact, I'll let him introduce himself properly. I write as R.V. Raman, although my Full name is R. Venkatraman. It's uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, especially when you go for international audiences. So I shortened it to R. V. Raman. Now, I've been a, a reader of crime fiction from the time I was in school. So Christie and Conan Doyle and some of those golden age uh, writers were my favorites. And I have always wanted to write, but never had the confidence, never had the time to do it. So when I was about 50 years old and I was approaching retirement, I decided to take a shot and uh, I started with fantasy. Uh, from fantasy, I moved on to, uh, to crime fiction and I ended up writing four books set in corporate India. Corporate India because that's a place I'm very familiar with. Uh, so I wrote about that and once I had some confidence in myself, I took a shot at writing a traditional mystery, and that is where we get. That first contact you had when you were at school, how did that come about? How did you first get into crime fiction? In my house, uh, my mother, my sisters, my father, they were all big readers of books. And, you know, at that point of time in the 60s and 70s, we didn't have television, we didn't have any of that. So our entertainment was largely reading books. So one of my sisters, my elder sister, introduced me to Christie and Conan Doyle, and I really stuck with that. And my other sister introduced me to Asimov and science fiction. I got stuck into that as well. So that's how it started. And I thoroughly enjoyed myself uh, in reading these books. Beyond Christie and Conan Doyle, what directions did you explore in crime fiction? Oh, mostly... um, British authors could be uh, G.K. Chesterton, any of the other, Edgar Wallace, all that. And of course, the American authors, uh, Perry Mason, uh, Stanley Gardner, Ellery Queen, you know, the whole, uh, the whole suite. I tried all of them. Of course, what I read was limited by what was available in libraries. And since we didn't have Kindle those days, uh, I found later when I bought my first Kindle, that there were a whole number of golden age authors whom I hadn't even known about. So I spend a lot of time now picking up old books and reading them. I'm still very fond of golden age. Were there particular things about it that you liked, particular aspects that drew you to it? Golden age takes me back in time to a world which I I have not seen. So that is one huge attraction. Second is that almost all of them are cerebral puzzles and I am a person who is a little... I give favor to that. I I like cerebral things rather than necessarily emotional stuff. And Golden Age is very much like that. And, uh, you know, even at that point of time, when I would read Golden Age mysteries and some of the thrillers, 
I always had a liking for clean writing, you know, which just which doesn't have uh, profanities and stuff like that. It's just that I'm a person like that. So these are the three things that really uh, appeal to me. Uh, and that's if you see my books today, I don't write one word of profanity. It's all clean writing. I would like my writing to be read by everybody in the house. You know, could be children, could be school children. That makes sense, I guess, given that you were quite young when you came across these books yourself, that you'd want to write to the the you of today. Yeah, exactly. And you mentioned there that these books enabled you to experience a, a world and places that you'd you'd never seen. And is it right then that most of those books that you were finding were Western or even British and American? I would say about 80% of them were actually British, 20% American. I don't really recall very many other books. I, I do remember reading a couple of French books that were translated in English. Uh, I don't remember reading, let's say, Japanese books or, or, or Chinese books, which are available now. So that's how it was. Uh, it took me to uh, the UK and uh, London, at least uh, in 19th century London, seemed very, very familiar to me. Baker Street uh, felt like the street next door. So I mean, that's how much... Uh, I liked it. And the American writers were largely in New York and LA. So it made me, and at that point of time, international travel wasn't there. As I said, television wasn't there. If I were to see anything in London or, or LA, it would have to be in a movie or read it in a book. Did you start to think, you know, I really enjoy this kind of writing but where are the stories that are set in places I know? Where are the stories from India? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That was certainly a very strong thought in my mind. And quite honestly, if you look at what was available in India, see, India is a very, very old civilization, thousands of years old. So we have some epics. We have a lot of stories in different languages, not necessarily English. But for some reason, mysteries didn't seem to be very popular. There was a lot of mythological stuff. There was a lot of thriller kind of stuff. Uh, but mysteries were very, very few. One or two old writers who used to write mysteries, even if you look at the non-English writers. Uh, so I did want to read mysteries uh, that were set in places that I knew, that I could you know. Like I would think that if I were living in London and I was reading a Christie novel, I could walk out to Baker Street. I could go to... Paddington, you know, those kind of things I couldn't do in India. So that was certainly a lacuna. I wanted to do that, uh, but didn't have much opportunity. There weren't any mystery writers in India. Are there mystery writers, Indian mystery writers, that you now read and enjoy? Now, there is a whole slew of writers. In the last about 10 years or so, a number of new writers have come up. But as a group of mystery writers... We are still in our infancy. Uh, many of these stories are, uh, I would say, copies of international stories, right? That, that uniqueness hasn't yet come through. And one of the things that I think we need to do a lot better while writing uh, mysteries in India is that we need to really Indianize it. There, there is so much of uniqueness in any country, and certainly India does have it. Uh, we need to use that. And that is probably starting to happen now. I would say that in the last two years or since the pandemic began, I must have read about um, between 50 and 70 Indian uh, crime writers, not just mystery, but others also. It's a hugely varied lot. And I do like it. The, there are some of them are current, many of them are present day. Some of them are set in the Mughal India or in the British India. Uh, that's fun as well. Because obviously, as you say, there's many, many hundreds of years of history there. So it does make sense that historical fiction and crime fiction would be a fruitful area to write in. And so you having become a fan of crime fiction very early on, where did the ambition to write your own mystery come from? Like I said earlier, when I was approaching 50 and um, retirement was looming, uh, one of the concerns I had was, what would I do after retirement? Because I've been having a professional career, which is very, very taxing. 
And suddenly, if there is nothing to do, that vacuum would be very difficult to manage. I'd seen that with my father. So I said, one of the things I should do is to try and write, to keep myself intellectually occupied. But that all started, like I said earlier, with fantasy. That time, my children were in school, and they are big fans of a lot of drinks. So what I did was, I, the three of us after dinner, we would sit and talk, and we created a fantasy world of our own. And once we created the fantasy world, one of the boys said, uh, why don't you write something? So I wrote one scene and I showed it to them. They liked it. They said, what happens after that? I wrote a second scene and that went on and on and on. And I, within two years, I found that I had a four book series of fantasy, which I self-published on, on Amazon. Then I realized that I could write and I decided uh, that I would take a shot at something a little more contemporary. I wanted to do Christie uh, kind of a thing, but it's, you know, uh, really good mysteries are very difficult to write because logically they have to fit very, very well. And I, like I said, I didn't have the confidence. So I wrote a thriller. So thriller set in corporate India. I knew it very well. It's set in banking. It's about banking fraud. So that's how I started. And uh, now I find, now I'm 60. So this was 10 years back. Now that I've retired, I find that this is an excellent hobby to have. And you chose to write in English as opposed to any other language. Well, yes. Uh, our, my medium of in, uh, instruction in school has always been English. <clears throat> A few subjects would have been in Hindi, but otherwise largely English. That makes sense, yes. Once you'd got your confidence up with your fantasy novels and your corporate thrillers, you then embarked upon writing your first Golden Age style mystery. What was the process of doing that like? How did you begin? Okay. I had made one decision earlier and that was the setting. So I said, if I'm going to write a traditional mystery, I'm going to put it in a remote mansion, which is a setting which is very often used, not just by Christie and Conan but many others as well. So that is something I had decided. And as I was writing my corporate thrillers, there was this mystery bubbling up inside me. So once I finished the fourth book, I said, okay, now I want to take a shot at it. And I started writing A Will to Kill. And what was really interesting about that book is that I managed to write it in something like seven weeks flat, about 50 days. I usually take about six months to eight months to write a book. But this thing, because it was bubbling in me and everything was there in my head, it just came out. Well, I was lucky that... uh, when my agent showed it to a, to a publisher, they picked it up immediately, so I was quite happy about that. After the break, we go on a mystery tour of India. This episode is sponsored by Outplay Entertainment, which has joined forces with Agatha Christie Limited to bring Hercule Poirot to their free-to-play mobile game Mystery Match Village in a limited time season pass. Players can, for the very first time, team up with the legendary detective and travel to Egypt aboard the SS Karnak to solve the case of Death on the Nile. With Poirot plus six other characters brought to life with stunning animation, players need to solve match three puzzles, hunt for clues, and speak with all of the suspects in order to progress through the story and find out who done it. To access the Death on the Nile season pass, players simply need to download Mystery Match Village and play through the first 10 levels of the main game. There is also a premium pass that offers extra rewards and exclusive cosmetics. And of course that's not all. Players can also enjoy six different cases in Mystery Match Village, joining Emma Fairfax in the 1930s English village of Kingsfall. Cases range from theft at the manor to murder in the bell tower, and with hundreds of levels, hidden object puzzles and town restoration, there's plenty of fun to be had by aspiring detectives. The game can be downloaded for free from the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store right now. This episode is brought to you by Libsyn, a simple, reliable and professional podcast hosting service that has been helping podcasters get their shows out since 2004. It's the service that I use to host and distribute She Done It, and that's really the strongest recommendation I can give you. I wouldn't have stuck with it all these years if I wasn't sure it was the easiest and the best. The interface is clean and straightforward, And on the rare occasions that I've needed help, their support team has been quick to find the solution. Getting your podcast on all the major platforms like Apple and Spotify is easy using their tools. 
and they provide stats to track so you can see how your show is growing. If you're thinking of starting your own podcast, or if you already have one and you need a new host, it's worth checking out Libsyn. Listeners of She Done It can get up to two months of free podcast hosting from Libsyn by using my promo code Caroline at checkout, or by clicking on the link in the episode description. That's code Caroline, C-A-R-O-L-I-N-E, for up to two months of free podcast hosting. So you mentioned there that the setting was something that a decision that you made early. Tell us a bit about the setting, because I think for lots of my listeners, they won't have ever heard of the part of India where the book happens. Okay. India, as you can imagine, is a vast place, huge place. Uh, If you look at it just by sheer numbers, it's thousands of miles across. And before 1947, when independence came, we were actually many different countries and kingdoms. It's only 1947 that we became a single country. So if you look at India, the variety is huge, hugely heterogeneous place, uh, different uh, cuisines, different languages, everything. Now, one of the things I have wanted to do is to set each of my books in a different place. And the Will to Kill is set in the hills of southern India, uh, which is close to where I live, Chennai. That's a place which has a lot of plantations, coffee and tea plantations, and very nice hills. A very, very picturesque place. Lots of rains, lots of fog, all that. And um, when the British were in India, Madras, now Chennai, was one of their capitals. So there was a lot of activity here. And in the summer, they would go away to the Nilgiri Hills, which is where this is set. As a result, in Nilgiri, you had a lot of British built buildings, mansions, offices, various things. So I have visited this place a few times when I was a kid and uh, absolutely delightful place. I think when I look at it and I read some of these books, uh, which are set in some of the moors in England, it doesn't seem very different. So that's where it is. And uh, I set it in a valley and a landslide takes place and the residents of the mansion are cut off. This is again a classic setting in, in Golden Age. So you have a situation where you have a group of close circle people, uh, about 10 to 12 of them. And then murder takes place, another murder takes place. And it's the classical story of how you how do you unravel that. There's a bit of modern day thrown in because WhatsApp and mobile phones are there. It's a set in present day. So that's how it is. Because that's a very interesting dilemma, isn't it, for the modern novelist? working with golden age tropes is how do you account for things like mobile phones and instant communication? Yes, it is. It is. And if you would remember Sue Grafton to conquer that problem, she sets her, uh, uh, her stories back in the eighties before the mobile phone was around. So yes, it is a challenge, uh, but I think we need to write for new audiences at a certain present day. You mentioned wanting to introduce people to different parts of India to show readers parts of the country that perhaps aren't on the standard tourist destinations and it's difficult to travel now anyway. Where else do you want to take your readers after this first book? Okay, so the first book is in the southern hills of India. The second book, which is out in the US, uh, is coming out in the UK uh, later this year. That is set on the banks of a river in central India, a place called Bundel Khand, which is very rich in history and legend. It's by the river there, and there is an island in the middle of the river, which is said to be haunted, and then murder takes place and various things. That's the second book. The third book is in the foothills of Himalayas, the big mountains, and there again it is in an old building. There are some very picturesque spots there which are world famous uh, i take them there the fourth book that i'm just about starting to write is in the backwaters of kerala in south india where you you have um, vast backwaters uh, coming in from the sea and it's a very very popular tourist spot uh, in the last 10 years has become very popular uh, people stay in houseboats and you're not just staying in a resort in a uh, in a building but you go and spend a couple of nights on a boat, a houseboat where you live in there. Uh, so that's what I'm writing as a fourth one. There are so many more possibilities. I mean, there are deserts here, there are beaches here, there are forests here. The, the possibilities are endless. And it sounds like you're 
really inspired. You've done three already. You're working on the fourth. So it's it's a style and a process that you're really enjoying. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I thoroughly enjoy this. Like I said earlier, it gives me something to do. It gives me something very intellectual to do. So it's, it's great fun. If I compare writing to reading, so reading gives me pleasure for a, if I take a book, it takes me a day, two days to read it. So that, that maybe 12 hours, 14 hours, it gives me pleasure. But writing gives me pleasure for 20 times, 30 times the amount of time. So it's, it's wonderful. And are you someone who, ha- you know, lots of writers talk about writer's block or getting stuck? Is that something that ever happens to you? I actually don't know whether it happens or not. That There are lots of times when I don't feel like writing or I'm at a point in the story where something is not right. Something stops me from writing the next one, the next scene. I don't know whether I'll call it a writer's block or anything fancy because sometimes you can write, sometimes you don't feel like writing, sometimes a part of you is saying, listen, there's something wrong here before you go ahead, try and fix this. So that happens to me very, very often, but I don't know whether I would call it a block. Do you have a a routine where you sit down for a certain amount of time every day or anything like that? No, nothing. See, since I picked this up after retirement, this is a hobby. And if I put any structure to it, it looks like work. So I don't want it to look like work. I just do it when I want to do. And generally, I don't take deadlines from publishers. I write my stuff and then give it to them. Then it's up to the ballers and they got. So I don't want to have dealt with deadlines enough for 40 years in my life. So I don't want any more. And what's the response been like to the, the books from your readers in different places? So Indian readers, American readers. Okay. So Indian readers, the corporate crime series has been received extremely well because I am practically sure that there is nothing similar to that in the Indian market. So it's been received very well. Unfortunately, whodunits are not very popular still in India, right? So publishers don't get the volumes, so it becomes difficult. So for me, I, I did face that problem after my after Will to Kill trying to sell the second mystery. I did have a problem in India. I still have a problem. But fortunately for me, a US publisher picked it up and then Pushkin in uh, uh, London uh, picked it up. There are more readers of who done it there. For some reason, I don't know why, but even when you look at Indian movies, while there are a zillion movies being made every year, there are no mysteries. For some reason, nobody really creates murder mysteries either on the screen or on the printed paper. So that is a bit of a disappointment, but it's okay. I intend to write a variety of things. I started with fantasy, then I did corporate fiction, then I doing Buddhanans. Next, I'm going to write a science fiction. Yes, well, that's fascinating that you say because I mean, from the little I know about it, I've heard you know the Indian book market itself is enormous. So many people, so many readers, and so on. It's interesting that this genre that is so popular in other places hasn't really taken off there yet. Yeah, the Indian market is huge, but when we get into the details of the numbers, you will find that textbooks, self-improvement books are what constitute about 98%. Fiction is very, very small. Here, most people consume fiction on the screen, TV, and uh, so reading is not very much. Reading for pleasure is not, a, is not as popular in India as it is in the UK and the US. Well, I hope that does start to change because uh, it does seem like there should be teenagers out there having the same experience you did getting into crime fiction and wanting to read about where they are. Yes, it is changing and it's changing in a slightly different way. See, Indian mythology is vast. It's bigger than Greek. It's bigger, you know, very large. So we have lots of new writers who are retelling mythology, Indian mythology in, in books. And there's a huge market for that. A lot of first-time readers are going in for it. And I'm pretty sure that in the next 10 years or so, they will move from mythology to other genres, including crime. That's really interesting, yes. And I'm glad as well that it's it's something distinctly Indian that's happening there. It's it's not being imported from anywhere else. Thanks to R.V. Raman for sharing his experience of crime writing in India with us. 
His first whodunit, A Will to Kill, is out now in the UK and the US, and the second in his Harith Athreya series, A Dire Isle, is coming soon. There are links to his books in the episode description and also to his website, where you can learn more about him and his work. This episode was hosted by me, Caroline Crampton. Find links to all the books we mentioned and other information about this episode at shedoneitshow.com slash thewhodoneitinindia. I publish transcripts of every episode, including this one. Find them all at shedoneitshow.com slash transcripts. She Done It is edited by Ewan McAleese, member support for the She Done It book club from Connor McLaughlin. The podcast's advertising partner is Multitude. Thanks for listening. I'll be back in two weeks with a new episode.